Hello, welcome to the Black Enterprise Wealth Building and Real Estate Summit. I am Charlene Reinhardt, author of Dividends Are a Queen's Best Friend. I'll be moderating this session on the landlord life. You're in for a treat. We have two phenomenal panelists here today. First, we have Aisha Selden. She's the author of Mud to Millions and a Real Estate Investor. Then we have Jamisa McIver Bennett. She is a real estate investor and CEO of Rosebud Investments. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Thank you, Charlene. Aisha, let's start off with you. How did you get started in real estate investing? Because I recall your story. You started off in the projects of South Philly and became a millionaire by 30. And real estate investing helped you to do that. So let us know, how did you get started? Um, I started building a portfolio um, early on. I was 24, I believe, when I bought my first property. Um, my story, like many Black Americans, I grew up in the hood in South Philly. And my focus was figuring out how I could uh, essentially own in my community. So I watched my mom sell our property um, that we lived in, that I grew up in uh, back in 98, right on the cusp as the neighborhood was gentrifying. I told my mom to hold on to that property. She sold it for about 35 or 40,000. Uh, about 10 years later, that property was worth probably somewhere in the vicinity of half a million today. It could sell um, in as is condition or as was condition, probably somewhere around three quarters of a million dollars. So I was, um, I was positive that that wouldn't happen to us again. So I started building my portfolio early because I wanted to own um, in communities like the ones that I grew up in uh, that I could also give back to. I could provide good and quality housing. So I bought my first house at 24, it was a HUD home, um, and I've been building ever since. Wow, so we often talk about real estate as one of the oldest and most popular forms of building wealth. That's why this session is so important, but a lot of people may not realize they can start early. Jamisa, you started at an early age, but you just happened to fall into it. Can you tell us about how you got started in real estate investing? Um, it's so ironic, because I'm from South Philadelphia as well. I'm the eldest of 10 siblings, which pretty much put me on a path to be very responsible early on. And my grandma, I took care of her a lot. You know, she was able to do things for herself, but I would still take her grocery shopping and take her to doctor's appointments. So one day she said she wanted me to be in charge of her property if anything ever happened to her. So she added me to her deed and it was fine and dandy because she actually still lived there. So she took care of all of like the maintenance and things of that nature. And then when I was 19 years old, she passed away. And then the property was like all on me. Now I was a cashier at the time. I was a mom too. I had one child and I was pregnant with my second and I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, okay, all right. The house is really mine. Like, what do I do? Then it's deferred maintenance, right? Cause you're talking about a grandma. Um, it's the taxes, you know, all of these things. So I did attempt to, you know, get the property fixed up, come together with my family, come up with a different plan. Cause my original intention was just to keep it. But then I realized it was overwhelming and I couldn't keep it. So I ended up selling the property. Now, when I sold it, I cleared 152, which was really cool. But then I found out, hey, you're in the middle of gentrification. You could have sold it for 350 or you could have not sold it at all. So it was like at that very moment, that decision that I made threw me into like a crash course for real estate. And it was like one thing after another. And I just decided to take all of those things and learn and experiences and they helped me to further my journey. It definitely sounds like a crash course in real estate. It was insane, yes. Jamisa, what educational resources did you rely on to get started? Did you automatically know what to do or was it more based on the experience that you had watching your mom's property go up in value and lose net that you decided to dive in and do your own research? Well, for me, it was really just me figuring it out. YouTube was my primary source of education alongside Instagram. Um, that's actually how I met Aisha, no lie. Everybody who's like in the, the connection of real estate. So I would look at hashtags, I would find people. And I think Aisha may have been trending at a point in time or something like that. I don't know if she remembers this, but this is like five, six years ago. I got in her DM and said, hey, listen, I see that you're an investor. I'm like sort of an investor. I have eight properties. I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. And she sat down with me at a Starbucks. It was like me and maybe five other random strangers she took time out of her day to sit down and educate us. And um, it was like that for me because she wasn't the only person that I did that to. So I would show up to real estate meetings. Anybody who was an investor, 
I would sit around them. I would learn and pick bits and pieces to figure out how to further myself. Because what I did do is I reinvested everything that I got from the original sale. So that was really good. But I ended up being house rich and cash poor. So after the first year, I had nine properties, but not all of them were fixed up. I didn't have any more of the liquid to fix it up. So that's when I kind of got into the monopoly playing thing, like in real life, though. And it was people like Aisha who actually helped me. Wow. Aisha, can you go into that? House rich, cash poor. Jamisa just talked about that. But what do you feel about that? When it comes to real estate investing, should you be cash poor? What are those yeah. financial steps you need to take? Yeah, I mean, that's actually, um, that, I think that's something that a lot of real estate investors do. A lot of investors put so much of their cash, their, invest, their, their liquid investments into real estate. Um, but I think that we need to be cognizant of the fact that there are issues that come up owning real estate. I mean, roofs go, uh, windows need to be replaced, hot water tanks go, HVAC systems go, the, the mechanicals, the electric system, the plumbing. Um, most houses in Philly, at least, were built prior to 1950. So um, if that thing hasn't been repiped since the 1950s, chances are there's a cast iron pot pipe in there that is your sewage line. Um, those things are costly to fix and replace. You got to make sure that you have a sufficient amount of reserves. And that's one of the, one of the biggest challenges that I find with new investors uh, specifically is they'll say things like, my, my rent on a property is $1,200, my mortgage is $800. That means I'm positive cash flowing $400 a month. Um, in a perfect world where nothing breaks, nothing goes wrong, nothing, there's no mechanical issues in the property, sure, that is the case. But the reality is we all know that there is no perfect, um, there is no perfect world. Things will go wrong with real estate. So you got to make sure that you have a sufficient amount of resources and cash flow in the event that something were to happen, or at least access to uh, the credit to be able to take care of some of those needs. How do you think about that? How do you think about your financial plan and make sure that you have enough cash reserves? What advice do you have? I know, Aisha, you check your net worth and you consistently look at your income and expenses. Can you walk us through what items should we be looking at to make sure we're good? Yeah, so I do a net worth review twice a year and I have done so every year for probably the last 21 years. So I look at all of my assets, my is all of my liabilities. And I do that every, I start in May, it finalizes in June. I start in November, it finalizes in December. Um, and I just look at the progress, the progression, how much I have liquid, what percentage of my portfolio is in liquid versus illiquid assets. Um, not, not, not only do I own real estate, but I also own um, cash. I have a franchise. Uh, I've got you know stocks, of course. So I really want to make sure that I'm looking at everything big picture, because I think that one of the challenges uh, that we find with a lot of investors is that real estate people tend to be totally real estate. So they put literally every single dime that they have into real estate. Stock people tend to be stock people and they put every single dime they have into stocks. And then you've got the folks who are scared and don't trust anything and they put everything in cash um, and they're losing money through something called uh, something called inflation risk. I mean, the fact that their purchasing power is actually losing money. So, um, so you want to make sure that you're diversified, um, not not every investment is great for everyone. You've got to find a comfort zone, find out what you're comfortable with, um, and make sure that you're investing accordingly, accordingly. But I do want to make sure, because we're talking specifically to folks that either are landlords or want to be landlords, I want to, want, want to make sure that people know you've got to make sure that for every single property that you have, you have a sufficient reserve. So when you're planning out uh, and budgeting for a property, you have uh, prepared for things like a vacancy rate. Your property will not always be occupied 100% of the time. You want to make sure that you plan for uh, repairs and maintenance. Something will go wrong. You will have a leaky toilet. You have a running toilet. You will have a, a leaky faucet. You got to make sure that you prepare for that. You want to make sure that you prepare for large capital expenditures. So that's uh, the sewage line needing to be replaced. The stucco on the outside of your property needs to be replaced. You want to make sure that you adjust and account for that. You want to, if you're not going to do the management yourself, I mean, we've heard horror stories about landlords that try to work directly with their tenants. So you may want to um, uh, add in there the cost of hiring someone to do your management. And then of course, you want to make sure that you account for your hard costs, like your mortgage and utilities, things that you know are going to come up. Those are really good points, Aisha. Jamisa, I know that you are 27 and have 26 properties, but you also purchased those properties with cash. Can you walk us through the financial plan that you had to make that happen? Uh, so my financial plan was called Young and Reckless. Um, I, do not, I do not advise people to go off the route that I took, but I am one of those people, like I persevere through anything. I am very ambitious. I'm like, okay, I will find a way. That's my whole thing. Now, I do have one mortgage, so I want to be honest. I have one mortgage, and the way that I made sure that I can keep up with everything 
Because at first, I'm going to be honest, it was just due to lack of education. And I remember at a point in time, I actually had a conversation and they were like, yo, you cannot put all your money in real estate. Like, what are you doing? You have to have more money. Now, instead of me leveraging, I decided to just create a different stream of income. So I do run a company that is high six figures. So that actually funds a lot of the real estate things. And then for the properties that are rented out, well, then I make sure that I actually still do landlord tenant accounts. For a lot of people who's like just getting into real estate, they don't understand the logistics and the legalities of it. You are supposed to have a landlord tenant account. There's not supposed to be a time that you have a property that you are renting out and the taxes are not paid or, you know, things that are actually up to the landlord to take care of, those should be accounted for. So I don't really spend much of my rental income, believe it or not. A lot of those are in reserve. So if something was to happen and something crazy was to pop up, I'm like, okay, well, here's six months worth of rent that I actually have here. So I can cover where my tenant is to stay. So for me, it was not a financial plan. It was literally, it was like survival of the fittest for me. I kind of learned as I went along. And obviously when you know better, you do better. But until then you just do. And that's really what I did. Cause I just like listening to Aisha speak, I'm one of those people who are highly intelligent and I can comprehend really well, but there are people who instantly like they get intimidated by hearing all of these things and it's like, how do I do it? And what I realized is while there is a right and wrong way to do everything, you still have to find your peace in the middle. Like you have to find the right way to do it, but you have to make sure it's something you're comfortable with. And that's how you decide if being a landlord is even for you. Because there's other ways that you can invest in real estate without actually being a landlord. I don't think a lot of people look into REITs or like joint ventures or things like that. There are ways that you can invest in real estate, make money from real estate, but not be a landlord. Like being a landlord is not for everybody. Um, as Aisha mentioned, some people actually need property managers. I'm one of those people who, okay, I'm good with people. I'm good with management. I can strategize really well. I know that if I'm not a slumlord and I put you in a house that's fully put together, the odds of you calling me for anything is really rare, but I make sure that the lease stipulates certain things. So if there's minor things that need to be fixed, okay, take this out the rent, make sure you give me an adequate receipt, you know, things like that. Everybody can't deal with that. So I think that the first piece of advice that I would give anybody outside of creating a really solid plan for how you're going to do it is decide what aspect of real estate are you actually interested in? Like some people are just good for flips. That's what you guys want to do. You buy a property that's dilapidated. You put work into it to increase value and you sell it. That's some people's mojo. For me, I hate that aspect of real estate. I mean, I love the fact that it brings me large sums of money, but I don't like the work. I don't like the contractors. I don't like the headache. I actually like, because obviously I'm a mom, I like having that security. Like, okay, every month I can expect to make this much. And once I add something else to my portfolio, I can expect to make this much. I like having that stability and that solid foundation. Just to kind of um, piggyback on something that Jamisa said, and I wanna make sure that it's her, she talked a lot about reinvesting her cash flow, her, her rent rolls back into her properties. And I think that that's such an important and valid point. Thank you for bringing it up, Jamisa, because you know most small business owners, like when you think, when you talk to anyone who's early on, uh, someone who's starting a business from scratch, very rarely do you hear a conversation that sounds like, you know, whatever profits the business or whatever net income the business generates, I spend it, you know, where I increase my lifestyle. There's, there's this thing called lifestyle inflation, where literally as your income increases, so does your lifestyle, right? Yeah. Most small business owners fundamentally understand early on, I'm going to have to reinvest almost everything back into my business. And it's, there's always a, an odd disconnect when someone starts um, investing in real estate, like they, 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 they don't entirely equate Becoming, becoming a landlord to starting a business. Very early on, like any other business as a landlord, most of your profits should be reinvested into building reserves, building cash flow, paying down the mortgage, making sure that you set aside adequate amount of money and an adequate amount of money in case your tenant stops paying you, in case you got to go to eviction court, like whatever. Um, I tweeted something prior to COVID. It was like in November of 2019. I, I, I tweeted, you should have anywhere between three to six months of your expenses in a readily accessible cash reserve. And at the time, so many of my tweets were popping off, going viral. That was like crickets. It was like, no one, no one cared. Like three to six months of your expenses and cash reserves. That's boring. No one wanted to talk about that. Nobody like, wants to talk like, about it, being it, responsible. Yeah, it was stone cold crickets on that tweet. I'm like, yo, I'm telling y'all. Like, it's you know, I, I understand the economy's booming. Everything's going well. This is November 2019. Before we, you know, before uh, Cardi B started screaming coronavirus, like before any of this um, started popping off, and I'm like, you know this is important. Like, you know, and I, I understand, I get it. The economy is going well, stocks are doing well, housing's going, going good. And then of course, you know, a couple months later, um, I could not have been more right. 
And that's what happened. Uh, the pandemic came and a lot of people were unprepared. Like I, I just have to call a spade a spade. They were ill-prepared because they did not have um, adequate reserves. Now, lucky for me, there, I don't really have a really large overhead, but I was overly prepared. And I think that that was a wake up sign for a lot of people, because like you said, being a landlord is a business, um, regardless of if you're doing it just for extra income or just your leisure, whatever, it is still a business and it should be ran as such. Because the same way you can evict a tenant for not paying, you can be held, uh, you know, I don't know, it wouldn't be called contempt, but you can be held responsible for the things that you do that's not correct. Like I know people who have tenants who've had leaky pipes for months at a time, but like I'm seeing them and they're having like bags and shoes. And there's something to be said about that. Again, like I said, I was responsible. But also being from an urban area, I always was taught like it's conditioning for me to prepare for the worst, even though the worst may never happen. Um, even for me, like my primary is amazing. It's huge. I love it. But I was a landlord to maybe like 10 or 11 people before I actually went on to purchase my home. It was a home that I wanted. And because I was able to hold out and wait my turn, I was able to get exactly like the deal was perfect. It was perfectly put together. But I knew so many people along the way, like, oh, are you still renting? Why are you doing it? That doesn't make sense. You have tenants, you have this, you have that. But it wasn't the right time. You have to make sure that you guys have a cushion when stepping out into the world because it's unforgiving. The economy is unforgiving, okay? I just want to say that. I ain't going to talk too much about it. Aisha can tell you more about the economy than me, but I'll tell you it's unforgiving. You don't do it right. You two are hitting on some important points. You have to have your money, right? If you want to be a landlord, everybody thinks I'm going to get rich in real estate. If you have your money, right? And you know your numbers. So let's dive into those numbers. A lot of people are fascinated by the landlord life because you get an extra stream of income for life, right? Jamisa and Aisha, you both touched on that. Let's talk about net worth. How does being a landlord help your net worth? Yep. So I, I think, and, and, and Janisa can, um, can talk about this as well. I think that buying real estate is one of the easiest ways and one of the best ways in America to, to build wealth, the equity that you have in your property. So when I say equity, I mean essentially what the property is valued for, the current appraised value minus the debt that you owe on it. So if the house is worth 400000 and you've got a mortgage on it for $200,000, um, the equity would be 200000 So that that 200,000 is what becomes a portion of your, your net worth. That's a part of your, your that net um, asset is, um, is what can help you build and accumulate wealth. And as that property becomes worth more and you're paying the mortgage every month, so the theory, the debt should be less on that property, your equity continues to build and so does your net worth. Um, we've seen there was a report done by, I think Redfin uh, last year that said that um, houses, equity in black communities appreciated um, the, by the greatest amount uh, out of any other neighborhood, um, out of any other predominantly you know, white or, or Latino community. Um, in black communities, it increased last year um, more than any other community for the first time ever. So you know, that's, that's important. One of, the, one of the challenges of that article that of course went into the fact that um, you know, most of the homes weren't owned by um, black homeowners. So that's the discouraging part. So I think that obviously we need to figure out how to um, change the narrative on that, obviously own more um, in our own communities so that we can also benefit from these equity increases. Yeah, I, I agree. I just want to piggyback off of that. So before the whole real estate thing for me, because like I said, I'm from South Philly. I was raised by my great grandma. My grandma that passed away, her name is Rose. So that, that's my grandma. And then my grandfather passed away when I was about seven. So just within like a four block radius, there were three properties that were owned in our family that were valued at about a million dollars. If not, I think it was maybe 1.1 million or something like that. Like we're right on 18th and Dickinson. And then a property that I sold was like 16th and Dickinson. But nonetheless, ignorance is not bliss. It actually costs a lot. So like having equity is not enough. You have to actually understand equity and understand how to use it because values are dictated by appraisals and things of that nature. So it can literally be one day where you have $200,000 worth of equity. A bad appraisal can knock that down. Like I've had friends who had to challenge appraisals and things like that. So just having equity in your property, it doesn't really matter if you don't know how to tap into it and actually use it for your, the greater good. That's where it comes in with leveraging. So just with those properties alone, when I sold mine, my great grandma was like, okay, well, I'm going to sell mine too. Right? So we sold two properties. Luckily, we still have one left, one out of the three. But we sold two properties and it was just because I wasn't educated. What I could have done when I sold that first property was use my profits to then fix up 
my grandma, my great grandmother's property. Okay, to increase the value, have the equity in it, and then maybe we could have refinanced or whatever to get the third one up to par. That's not what happened. So we literally sold about five hundred to six hundred thousand dollars in property because we didn't know. So essentially, we let go of the equity. And there's a lot to be said in there because I know so many families who own properties and they're like, hey, I don't want anything to do with it. Or I don't, they don't understand the value of what they actually have. Just because your property may be dilapidated or it's abandoned, it didn't have any work in a while. That does not speak to the value of how much it could be worth. I kicked myself in the butt about that because I'm like, okay, not for nothing. I have to buy my grandma's house back. I sold it for 152. If I wanted to buy it today, I think it's about 725. I'm going to wait till they don't want it no more. I'm waiting for like some type of crash or something so I can go back and collect. But I also have to buy the third property back. Can you imagine letting go of something for pennies on a dollar? Like I sold mine for 152. My great grandma sold hers for about 98. Right now, she's a three story. So I'm feeling like she's coming in alone at about 800,000. Like it's insane. Could you imagine having to pay almost $2 million for something that you gave away for almost nothing? And that's what I see a lot of people struggle with. So she spoke on equity, but I need you guys to understand what equity actually is and how it can affect you guys for the positive. Use what you have to then go on and get what you want later on, but don't make rash decisions. This is me going back to not being young and reckless. I know better now, so I can tell you guys better. Be conscious of what you guys have. Use what you have to get what you want later. Powerful. What would you say are some more common mistakes or pitfalls that people make early on in the process that can be avoided and just really help them build their wealth if they knew it? Um, Instagram. I'm sorry, I have to say as a millennial, we run Instagram, we run the social media world. It is such a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you're able to reach people all the time, but I see it as a curse because I have people who are comparing their lives or them being a cashier because you know, that's what I'm popular for. I was once a cashier and now I can buy a supermarket. Like that was the running trend. But do not compare my year seven to your day six or day seven. Okay, don't look and feel like, oh, I have to do HGTV. Those shows are 45 minutes. That is nothing compared to what you're going to experience in real life. Be careful who you follow. Be careful what you're, you know, consuming as it pertains to real estate. Not everybody's a guru. You really have to stick your foot in the water to, you know, test the temperature for yourself. And I see a lot of people right now and they're just going off of what looks sexy. You have to know that when we post stuff on Instagram, right? And I'm not guilty of this because I'm pretty transparent in my posting. But you have to know when you're looking at something on Instagram, it's the best moment. That's why I love following Aisha. She's going to show you the house that does not have a back on it. I cannot, it may be her and three other investors that I follow who actually went through that part. Hey, you can buy a house that does not have a roof. You can buy a house that does not have a back. So by her doing that, she's doing everybody a great justice. But for the other people who are not, you're really setting a false expectation because I have these people who are looking to get rich quick and that is not how it works. I mean, you could get rich quick, but it's not gonna last long. So you really have to have a really good expectation. The, the biggest thing that you can do wrong is looking at somebody else's progress or looking at their investment and mirror that exactly. I didn't do that. The Virgo in me wouldn't allow it. I took what I needed. You know what they say, chew up the meat and spit out the bone. I was able to do that. But a lot of my followers, like when I'm having conversations with them and I'm being honest, they're like, well, no, I thought it was, or I thought that I could just do X, Y, Z because I saw X, Y, Z. I'm like, no, it's not the same. So for those who are listening and looking, just be really, really mindful of what you're consuming and then setting expectations on it. Because I think that is the biggest way to derail you from actual success in a great process. Um, to, to, to piggyback on that, um, I think that there are two very common mistakes that new investors make. Um, one, not knowing how to appropriately um, evaluate a deal. So um, you guys may want to jot this down. Um, a formula I use for every single property as I acquire it is um, a formula called unlevered yield on cost. Um, one of the challenges is that um, leverage, which is basically borrowing to buy or invest in a property, leverage can make a deal look su substantially better than it actually is. So this formula that I use, unlevered yield on cost, if you Google it, you can probably find a whole lot more information. I'll try to um, very quickly conceptually um, explain how it works. So essentially 
unlevered basically means no debt on the property. So I assume whether I'm going to or not, I assume that I'm going to buy every single property in cash. So that would be the acquisition and the closing cost. So I buy the property, let's say I pay 80,000 for the property, 5,000 worth of closing costs, I'm in for 85,000. If I then have to renovate the property, $15,000 worth of renovation cost, um, I will also include that in my total upfront cost, assuming it's going to be out of pocket. So at this point, I'm all in for 15,000. What I then do is I look at the income that I'm going to generate from my property. So before I evaluate or before I buy any deal, my expectation is, or my question to myself is, how long is it going to take my capital to come back to me through rent roll? So I'm not, um, there's a couple different ways to invest as a, as a real estate investor. You can be someone who's betting on appreciation. I don't want to bet on appreciation because it's not certain, it's not guaranteed. And historically, if you look at the average rate of um, what homes appreciate for, to me, it's not worth the risk. Um, I can, however, bet on cash flow. So I assume if I'm all in on this property at 100,000, I then look at what my gross rents would be. So that's my rent without any expenses. And then I subtract out some of the things that I talked about earlier. So I look at what my, um, my insurance would be for the property. I look at what my utilities would be if I'm responsible for the property. I look at a vacancy rate. I look at my repairs and maintenance. Um, and I typically use those as percentages of my gross rent. Um, I factor that down to my net income. So if my rents are um, $1,500 a month and I boil it down to I'm getting uh, $800 a month worth of net rent. I'm then looking at roughly $10,000 a year worth of net income on my $100,000 outlay. That would basically mean that if I'm getting 10 grand a year uh, on a $100,000 investment, I've got roughly a 10% return. So if it's gonna take me 10 years to get my capital back, I'm in as an investor, there are certain markets where I can do that. So if you're looking at like a Philly, a Baltimore, a Memphis, a Detroit, a Cleveland, a Dayton, Ohio, um, you're typically gonna get higher returns. Those are the markets that I primarily invest in. Um, if you were to look at markets like Los Angeles, Seattle, Boston, Washington, D.C., obviously New York City, those returns are going to be infinitely lower. Um, those returns, when you're investing in a market like a Los Angeles or New York, you're obviously looking more for appreciation. They are typically considered safer markets. Um, I invest for cash flow, so my expectation is that number needs to be at least 10% uh, or higher. Um, my expectation is um, I got to get at least a 10% number because I'm also a stock investor. So if I'm going to get as much as much work as I have to do investing in real estate, if I'm going to get anything less than 10%, I can just throw my money in the S&P 500 um, and not uh, exert the energy that it takes to invest in real estate. So that's a formula that I look at. And I think oftentimes people just don't know how to properly evaluate those deals in advance. So they're going back to the, the old, the, the last example I use where they're like, all right, well, if the, if the rents are 1500 and my mortgage is a thousand, that means I'm cash flow 500 now because you haven't factored in some of those other calls. Um, the other, the other, um, challenge I think that people make, and, and Jamisa touched on this a little bit, um, and, and that's not effective or appropriate use of equity. Um, I recently bought a property in Los Angeles in the View Park section, um, which is uh, an amazing neighborhood in the Los Angeles uh, area. And the property that I bought, I, you know, it was, it was, I mean, the houses are in this neighborhood selling for close to a million bucks. Um, the owner had owned this property for decades. I mean, I think probably 40, 50 years, the owner had been in this property. And one of the, when I checked the mail, the, the owner, the family, uh, because the owner had recently passed, the, the owner was about to lose the property um, because of a foreclosure. So the equity was increasing substantially and they were using the equity, but it got so big that they weren't able to pay the mortgage. And I think that that's, that's oftentimes um, a problem. People, you know, they, they use the equity in the property, not understanding that this is a cost that they have to repay. And they're not using that equity to make other investments. And then it becomes unaffordable. And then we see our grandparents and aunties and uncles losing these properties because as it appreciates, they're not effectively using that equity. Some because of, um, lack of education, lack of financial education, and some of it because, you know, just, you know, all the things that we have to deal with, um, just as Black Americans, you know, we just, we're dealing with so many things. Our income is typically less. I mean, I could go on about that, but um, those are two big mistakes that I think that investors make. Aisha, you just nailed those numbers. I think that's definitely a big part of the equation. You have to have a formula on how you plan to assess the deals. You mentioned that you are not basing everything on appreciation. Cash flow, cash flow is important. And I recently heard somebody say that profit is transient, income is forever. So to keep those income, keep that income generating from your asset is key. Now, Jamisa, for people who are thinking, I don't understand that financial lingo, I don't know where to start. 
how do I wrap my brain around this? What are my first steps to get involved and make this happen? Um, just rationalizing because everything she said is true. So you have to look at real estate like everything else in the world because that's exactly what it is. There is nothing you can do as a human that, and that does not involve real estate. When you're born at the hospital, that's a building. When you die, you get buried, that's land. You drive, real estate, air rights, real estate. The food you eat is grown somewhere, some type of farmland. It's real estate. So once you can wrap your head around that it's very simple, it actually becomes very simple. So for a beginner, um, numbers-wise, like Aisha, she nailed the numbers. She's a pro, okay, so she ran through it. But it's as simple as, first of all, just figuring out, okay, how much is this property worth? You have to think about what it's worth as is, and then we'll actually talk about the after repair value. But realtor.com, you can actually really look and see pictures. I use HomeSnap as well. There's a both, both free sites. Um, you go and you see, okay, this property looks like this. And there's something called a comp or a comparable in which that's how you decide what your property is worth. So if your house is a three-bedroom, one-bath, or the house you're looking to invest in is a three-bedroom, one-bath, you can literally go on realtor.com, put the address in, and it'll tell you what sold in the surrounding areas that was a three-bedroom, one-bath, assuming that it's the same size. So stay as close to size as possible. So that's how you can figure out what it's worth as is. You can then look at other numbers. Obviously, you'll see the difference. The lower the number, that's more as is. You'll see the pictures. It didn't have much work. It will also show you properties that were recently sold, and then you can actually see the finishes that were done. And that will give you an idea prior to you calling the contractor how much work. You can look at it and see, okay, this has new floors. I need new floors. Okay, this has recessed lighting. I have a drop ceiling. I had to change my ceiling and my lighting. Okay, the appliances look like this in that house. My appliances look like this. So you can literally look and see the difference between the property that you are interested in versus the property that it just sold for the higher number. And a lot of um, investors that I know, they use the 70% rule. I, because most of my investments are cash, I use 65%. So what you can do is take the after repair value. After repair value is exactly what it sounds like. The value after the property has already been repaired, right? Now, the way to do it is, is math. So you'll add up the three properties that sold, assuming that they're the same size as yours, and then you divide it by three. That will give you your ARV, right? And then you times that by 65%. For those who leverage or, you know, are you getting some type of funding, you can do 70. I know 70 is like the cat. I do 65. There's less wiggle room, but it works for me because I know my numbers. So you'll do that times the 65%. Now that 65% accounts for everything, acquisition as well as rehab. That 65% will let you know exactly what you are going to spend. You cannot offer more than that. And a portion of that 65%, you have to make sure you're sitting aside for rehab costs. So make sure when you're going and looking at this property, you know if it's a full rehab or not, you can obviously get a contractor to come in and do an inspection for you to tell you around about what the numbers would be. I would always say get more than one contractor, get two or three so that you can say, okay, the average I'm going to spend around about this much. Because you might have Johnny who will hit you in the head. You might have Henry that'll be extremely low, but there's going to be some type of pattern numerically speaking with these contractors that'll let you know, okay, so I'm looking at about this much no matter which way I go. So that 65% will account for what you are able to offer on this deal to make sure that it makes sense. Now that's the simple way to do it. Now, after that, you can go into the Aisha way and look at it like, okay, so once it's all fixed up, because what she spoke on was pretty much a breakdown of what is called the cap rate. And that pretty much just lets you know how much, it, I mean, how long it's going to take you to recoup everything that you put out and then a time frame it's going to take to do such. But just for a person who's starting out, look at how much the property is worth, do the 65% rule, and that'll at least let you know what to offer. Because as a beginner, most of you may not have credit or cash. You're probably going to start off wholesaling. A wholesaling is a really attractive way for beginners to build some income and to get some like real estate knowledge going on. But there's nothing worse than a wholesaler coming to an experienced investor trying to oversell a property. Could you imagine trying to come and sell Aisha a property for a hundred thousand more and she about to just run that math down? So do you know how that's going to make you look in the industry? Because then she might call me and say, you know, they're trying to sell me this property for it's going to be crazy. It's a small industry. No matter where you are doing real estate, this is, this is a trending thing right now. So you don't want to have your name as the person who's overselling. Don't be that person. Um, even if you don't make as much on a wholesale deal, it's okay because it'll become familiar and then you can always count on the next deal. There's actually wholesalers. That's like a job for them. They bring me deals. Like that, they know I'm going to close. They know I'm either going to purchase it myself or I'm going to have a person who can purchase it. So make sure that you're building up your rankings that way. 
Um, and like you said, just to get started, I would say wholesaling because it doesn't require too much of anything except time and knowledge. And you can actually learn as you go, as long as you're not overselling. So wholesaling is pretty much you being the middleman in a deal. So let's say that you, for instance, you're selling a property for a hundred thousand. I can agree and say, okay, Shalene, I'm going to buy this property for a hundred thousand from you. Contractually, I am agreeing to purchase the property for a hundred thousand. Now, I don't have to have 100000 in the bank because there is a clause or there should be a clause in your real estate sales contract that says that you can assign the contract. With you being able to assign the contract, you're able to assign all of the obligations that come with the contract. I agreed to purchase that property for 100000 I then call Aisha and I say, hey, I have a property to sell for 120000 Aisha is the one that's purchasing, so she's going to come to the closing table with the one twenty. Contractually, I agreed to purchase it for a hundred, so I owe you the one hundred thousand. But then that additional twenty will go to me as a wholesaler, and that's an easy way to make twenty thousand dollars. All I had to do was connect the seller with the buyer. But the biggest part of that is just making sure you're not overselling. So by me bringing that deal to Aisha, I have to make sure that it's worth it to her. I don't want to sell her something for a hundred and twenty thousand, and it's only worth a hundred and fifty, and it needs forty worth of work. You can see how that's not a, a really good deal. So you got to just make sure that you do know your numbers going in and you're making sure that you're being fair. But wholesaling is really a lot of people's like entry into the investing world. You do maybe two or three good wholesale deals. Now you have enough capital to branch out on your own. Even if you make 15, 20,000, well, that's enough to actually have a deposit for you to get lending. There's a lot of people who's doing, I think it's like down to 80% purchase and 60% every head. I know the numbers dropped a little bit during the pandemic, but I did see some increases in the lending world. So you don't need a ton of money to get started in real estate. You just have to have that knowledge. Acquiring that knowledge. And sometimes you don't need the knowledge all on your own. There are people who will help you get that knowledge. Aisha, can you talk about the people on your team who will either help you get that knowledge or make your life easier as a landlord? What people should you have on your team? So again, if, you, um, if you're not the best with talking to people about your money, have a property manager. I can't stress and emphasize that enough. There are some people who are just emotionally tied to how their property is handled and managed and, and, and lived in. Um, separate yourself from that process altogether. Get you a property manager. They typically, um, if you only got one deal with them, they typically charge around 10% of most rents each month. Um, if you have multiple properties with them, they may cut you a break and give you uh, a discounted rate at seven or 8% um, of your monthly gross rent. Um, the other um, team that you really need to help, I mean, a, a good construction team, a good contractor team can make or break your deal. Um, I think Jamisa hit on it a little bit earlier. Like if you have two or three contractors that, that go out, um, I think that finding a good construction team to help along the way, to help facilitate your deal or help um, as you go from start to finish, uh, from acquisition to renting, if you don't have a good construction team, um, that can blow you out of the water. I've seen so many different investors give up because they had a poor contractor team. They gave the contractor too much money. The contractor disappeared and they're back at square one, no money, and they still have a shell. So I think that um, both the property manager, um, making sure you have a good construction team and also making sure that you've got someone who can help manage your books. So if you've got if you, like a, a good bookkeeper, if you're not really good with uh, programs and software like Quicken, um, make sure that you have a good bookkeeper and accountant as well. And a project manager, too, because sometimes, like for you, you have a really good project manager. It's not going to be all the time that a person can be on site to see their rehab being done. Or they can be on site but not have any idea what's going on. Like, people don't understand the, the rehab numbers. Like, we just talked about, like, acquisition and purchasing. But you have to understand what lumber costs. Like, you have to know what lumber goes up. You have to know that you have to sheet rock this. You have to demo and frame it. So you have to be really um, conscious of that as well. Because finding a contractor, that's one beast. Okay, you got them. Making sure they do the right thing and sometimes having to keep an eye on them. That's a whole nother thing. Like I have been one of those people who've had a contractor run off on me. Luckily for me, I did the legwork ahead of time, like making sure that they had a license, having a picture of their ID, having a copy of their insurance. So it was easier for me to recoup my, my payments. But there are a lot of people who were not as lucky as me because they gave this person that they met at Home Depot a substantial down payment. Um, I know for me, I'm not given 50% of a project. I, I know people who require 50% and they cannot work for me at all. But there are people, you know, who just give out money and they're left, like you said, just stuck because all your money is gone or the vast majority of your money is gone and you do still end up with a shell. So I think project management is really good too. 
while you educate yourself on that aspect of real estate. Buying a house is one thing. Getting it fixed up is a whole nother ball game. You have to know to say, no, don't do this. Like there's been another situation where a guy wired one of my houses wrong and he attempted to close the wall. And I was like, that's not right. Like I could look at it and I could see that's not right. But I only knew that it wasn't right because I've been on other job sites in which not even my projects. I said, hey, can I come through to running your rehab and like learn? You have to take the time to learn. So I think that's really important too. Project management, not just property management. You want to have some project management if you're going to go on with the rehab part of real estate. Teamwork makes the dream work in real estate, right? Absolutely. Wow. Let's talk about the housing market right now. Given that it is booming right now, what should new buyers be thinking about and doing? You know, that's a great question. I think that um, there, there's a lot of things that are happening right now. You've got very low inventory in most markets. So if you look in most cities, there's not a lot of houses on the market. Also, interest rates are extremely low, which is creating some of the um, the boom that we're seeing today. So I think that new homeowners, new home buyers, even new investors just need to be really, really careful about the way that they approach buying. So one of the things I would stay away from is I would stay away from um, multiple offers and getting into a vicious bidding war. Um, I bought a property in 2007 at the last market peak um, that was underwater, meaning I owed more on it than it was worth for an, a number of years after that. So I think that, you know, we, we, we could, we need to be really careful with how we approach this housing market. So uh, we saw, we saw a property recently in DC was on the market for four days, had 88 offers on it, uh, of which 76 of those offers were cash offers. So you just got to be really careful because I think the property ended up going for $230,000 over asking price. Um, we're seeing that in a lot of markets. There are deals to be had in, in, in every market. I, I love real estate. I've made a lot of money in real estate. I would just say make sure that you're approaching cautiously um, and make, uh, make sure that you're analyzing uh, your deal based on some of the numbers that we've talked about if you're looking to move into the markets. This was a powerful conversation. There were so many gems and you two are young women doing this. So we know that this is possible. You don't need a lot of money. You just need knowledge, the right people and the right numbers to make it happen. I want to thank you, Jamisa and Aisha for contributing to this much needed conversation on real estate investing. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.